So now, let's look at some cases under this first category of state laws that facially discriminate against interstate commerce. As we look at these cases, ask yourself why a state would want to discriminate against interstate commerce. One reason, of course, is simple protectionism. A state might want to ban or tax imports from another state to protect a local market. For example, let's say New Jersey wanted to protect its historic market for Taylor ham, also known as pork roll. The state could impose a high tax on all Taylor ham sold in New Jersey that was not produced in New Jersey. Such a tariff would be facially discriminatory. It would also represent exactly the kind of protectionist measure that was common under the Articles of Confederation and that the Commerce Clause in the 1789 Constitution was designed to address. So this would be a relatively easy case. Another reason states might want to discriminate against out-of-state commerce could center on health and safety concerns. In fact, the next set of cases we'll examine mostly involve state health and safety laws, like the one in Philadelphia v. New Jersey, which banned the importation of waste from other states into landfills in New Jersey. You should note here that the use of the word discriminate in relation to interstate commerce is not a moral judgment. In fact, there may be many good moral reasons for this kind of discrimination, such as protecting against overuse of landfills. Discriminate here simply means treating commerce from out of state differently than commerce from within the state. So let's look at our first set of cases involving laws that facially discriminate against interstate commerce. Philadelphia v. New Jersey, a 1978 case, involved the classic example of a ban on importation of waste into New Jersey from other states. The ban's validity was litigated through the New Jersey Supreme Court, where it was upheld as a legitimate health and safety measure. On certiorari, however, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed. Notice that the ban was challenged not only by potential importers, cities and other states that needed places to dispose of their waste, but also by a number of private landfill operators in New Jersey. In his majority opinion, Justice Stewart first notes that the basic question is whether the law is basically a protectionist measure or whether it can fairly be viewed as a law directed to legitimate local concerns with effects upon interstate commerce that are only incidental. However, he also says that the inquiry is not only about legislative intent. Protectionism, he says, can reside in legislative means as well as legislative ends. New Jersey may have had a legitimate interest in limiting the waste in its landfills, but according to Justice Stewart, it cannot accomplish those ends by discriminating against out-of-state commerce, unless there is some good reason apart from its geographical origin to treat that waste differently. In his dissent, Justice Rehnquist, joined by Justice Berger, argued that this law was a form of quarantine law, a type of restriction the court historically had upheld. Obviously, the importation of waste presents potential health and safety problems, and Justice Rehnquist believed a state should be able to manage such problems through an importation ban. Note 4, after this case in our text, discusses quarantine laws and mentions the 1986 case of Maine v. Taylor in which the court upheld a state ban on the importation of certain bait fish into the state of Maine. What do you see as similarities and differences between a ban on the importation of ordinary solid and liquid waste into landfills and the importation of bait fish? Where is the line between an unlawful facial discrimination against interstate commerce and a proper quarantine law. There are, of course, many ways to make what is effectively a ban on interstate commerce look like something less than an absolute ban. Excessive out-of-state taxes or in-state subsidies are two ways of doing this, and the court has sometimes invalidated such schemes, as the notes after Philadelphia v. New Jersey suggest. Another kind of protectionist measure the court has examined is the home processing requirement. As we see in the Dean Milk case, a home processing requirement might involve a perishable commodity that must be pasteurized, graded, or specially bottled or packaged before it is ready for retail sale. The facial justification for home processing requirements could be that processing the commodity in close proximity to where it is harvested or produced ensures that the product shipped out of the state is safe for market. Of course, such a requirement also protects the development of local processing businesses. In Dean Milk, Justice Clark held in his majority opinion that health and safety regulation cannot discriminate against interstate commerce if reasonable, non-discriminatory alternatives adequate to conserve legitimate local interests are available. 
In this case, Justice Clark stated, a simple inspection requirement could satisfy the local interest in ensuring consistent quality even if the final processing were done out of state. In contrast, in his dissent, Justice Black argued that the home processing requirement did not discriminate against out-of-state commerce because milk for both the local and out-of-state markets were treated equally. All had to be processed locally. Do you think the majority or the dissent had the better economic argument in Dean Milk? Does Justice Clark's rule facilitate a truly national market, or would a national market tend to erode things like local processing requirements over time simply through market forces? The next two cases in the text concern a different kind of twist on local processing requirements, the use of a flow control ordinance to guarantee the financing cost of a new solid waste transfer facility. A solid waste transfer station reduces the distance a garbage truck needs to drive after collecting waste from municipal sources. Garbage trucks transfer their loads to large vehicles at the transfer station, which then bring the waste to regional landfills. Some transfer stations also include material recovery facilities, which sort recyclable materials for reclamation. I'm Clyde Harding business manager for commercial waste and transfer station at Citywide and today we are at the Citywide transfer station at Dynan Road. At the Dynan Road facility we receive general waste, we receive cardboard and uh, sweepings uh, and we also have metal recycling happening. General waste that we receive at our facility comes from a varied list of commercial and municipal clients. This waste is received at Dynan Road, it's compacted into our semi-trailers and then transport out to Wyndham Landfill. We also receive paper and cardboard, which is dropped off by internal as well as external clients. This cardboard is then baled and transported off to a paper cardboard recycler. We also receive sweepings at this facility from the City of Melbourne and the City of Yarra street sweeping contracts. And this is cleaned up and then transferred as clean fill to recycling centers. Our core business hours are Monday to Friday, 1 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. Whilst uh, at these times we receive general waste, our cardboard facility operates as a 24-7 operation. We also reduce our commercial clients' carbon footprint by them tipping their waste at our Dynan Road facility. Whilst we receive varied streams of waste, ranging from general waste to paper cardboard to sweepings, our core business is general waste. And with regards to our general waste volumes, we receive an approximate of 14,000 to 15,000 tons a month. That in turn relates to close to 180 to 200,000 tons per year. It can make economic sense for a region to integrate its waste management practices with groups of local transfer stations connected to a regional landfill and disposal facility. This is often connected to contracts with private waste disposal companies, which are paid to remove curbside waste and which must in turn pay fees to move the waste through transfer stations or to dispose of it at landfills. Something you should notice here, a theme we've been stressing in all of our discussions of the Commerce Clause, is that waste disposal is a form of critical infrastructure. You can't have flourishing municipalities and cities without means of removing solid waste and disposing of it safely. And this requires networks of specialized vehicles and facilities that can handle the job. The trend has been to privatize these kinds of facilities on the theory that competition would lead to better service and lower prices than government monopolies. The catch in this theory is that this kind of infrastructure usually requires some substantial upfront sunk costs in facilities and equipment and private entities want some kind of assurance of a return before they put their capital into this kind of use. This is where the flow control ordinance comes in. A flow control ordinance guarantees that a certain minimum volume of a municipality or city's waste will run through the facility, ensuring that processing fees for the builder to recoup its initial investment. In C.A. Carbone Inc. v. Clarkstown, a 1994 case, the court held that such an ordinance violated the Dormant Commerce Clause. The ordinance required that all non-hazardous solid waste collected within the town be deposited at the new transfer station. The party challenging this ordinance was a recycler that preferred to ship its non-hazardous, non-recyclable waste to cheaper processors outside the state. 
Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, saw this as just one more instance of local processing requirements that we long have held invalid. He then stated that discrimination against interstate commerce in favor of local business or investments is per se invalid, save in a narrow class of cases in which the municipality can demonstrate under rigorous scrutiny that it has no other means to advance a legitimate local interest. Justice Souter's dissent, joined by Justices Rehnquist and Blackman, argued that the transfer station should have been treated like a municipal facility, and not just like another private entity benefiting from protectionist legislation. But why should that matter? As we'll see in United Haulers Association and South Central Timber Development v. Wanaki, the market participant line of cases suggests that if the relevant market actor is the state or local government, privileges or monopolies that limit interstate commerce might be permissible. 